Welcome to the Lincoln City Council meeting of the 17th of July, 2017. Let us all rise for a Pledge of Allegiance followed by a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber. The order of business for the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item at hand. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue not on the agenda for that date nor plan for a future agenda. Uh, before we call the first item, uh, I've noticed we have a number of guests from far away. and. Uh, Carl, would you like to talk about that? Yes, thank you, Roy. Uh, we have uh, visiting with us today a, a large group who have come from very far away. Uh, individuals who are here from South uh, Sahara and South African nations. Uh, Linda Major, a call on you real quickly. Uh, would you like to introduce this group and, and why they are here? No, you can come up. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Roy. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name's Linda Major. I'm with the University of Nebraska. And with me here today, I have a group of 25 young leaders from sub saharan Africa. They're on the University of Nebraska campus for six weeks looking at civic leadership. I want to boast a bit. There were 64,000 applications for this program. A thousand were selected, and UNL was lucky enough to be one of the 38 institutions selected to host the 25 we have here today. Uh, they're doing a number of um, projects to really improve uh, their community and the betterment of, uh, of their citizens' lives. A very impressive group. So thank you for enjoying letting us be here today. Thank you. Welcome. All right, will the clerk please call the first item of business? Yes, we would request those giving testimony to please clearly state your name and address and to sign in on the sign-in sheet laying on the podium. Our first item of business is our public hearing consent agenda items one through six. Any discussion on these? Anyone would like to testify on these items? Okay. Next item, please. All right, if not, we can vote on these items. I need a motion for number one. So moved. Second. second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion. Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Item two was introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved by Jane, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Then item three was introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by John. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Abstain? Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Next then, our public hearing liquor resolutions. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward, raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. I'll call items seven and eight together. They are the application of the spigot for a Class C liquor license at 1624 O Street, as well as the related manager application of Terry McWilliams. Just raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Just state your name and address. 
My name is Terry McWilliams. Uh, I live at 4000 North 7th Street. Okay, questions for Mr. McWilliams. Tell us about your application. <laughs> well, um, I'm super nervous right now. As you can <laughs> That's see, okay. But, um, I'm hoping to uh, get a passing vote today and move forward along with my business. Okay. Are there any changes you proposed to the business that opposed to what was going on before at the spigot? <laughs> I, I'm going to do everything by the law and do everything right. Um, make sure I get everything paid um, and uh, just make sure that, that I do everything right for the most part. Okay. Now, uh, just a question about uh, uh, previously, and I know you're not associated with what went on there previously, but there were a number of noise complaints they're constantly coming our way. Do uh, you have any plan for handling noise? Yes. Um, the, the back is going to be soundproofed so that we, the, uh, you wouldn't be able to hear anything from the apartments and stuff above. Okay. Very good. Other questions? Thank you. And would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, if not, I'll call item 9, application of Rhino Dynamics for a special designated license to cover an indoor area measuring approximately 200 feet by 240 feet and an outdoor area measuring approximately 200 feet by 50 feet at Speedway Village at 345 Speedway Circle on August 12th between 8 a.m. and 2 a.m. Hi, I'm Scott Hatfield from Duffy's Tavern, Rhino Dynamics. Hey, tell us about the event. So the event is an MMA event. I think it was previously held, from my understanding, at the arena. And uh, they've moved it to Speedway Village, and we're going to cater the alcohol for the event. They're expecting 1,200 uh, attendees for the event. And it's uh, in the same place that the roller skating national championships are happening uh, as we speak. Okay. Questions for Scott? Is MMA... Masters of Martial Arts? I think or it's Mixed Martial Arts. Mixed Martial yes. Arts. Yes, okay. and it's a sanctioned event. Uh, it's a state-sanctioned athletic event. So the promoters have uh, a license and have sanctioned it uh, officially through those official channels, which I'm not exactly sure what those are, but uh, it's, it's an officially sanctioned sporting event. As someone who had to Google it, I can confirm that it's Mixed Martial Arts. <laughs> I was close. It's very close, yeah. Martial Arts, no less. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Okay. Next item. Mr. Chair, I would move approval of items seven, eight, and nine. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Next in are our public hearing resolutions. Item 10, Comprehensive Plan, one, uh, Comprehensive Plan, Plan Conformance 17009, approving an amendment to the Antelope Valley Redevelopment Plan to identify the Telegraph District Phase 2 redevelopment project, which includes up to four areas with building and parking improvements and connecting streetscape enhancements generally located south of O Street, east of 20th Street, and west of Antelope Creek, including M and N streets. Members of the City Council, David Landis, the Urban Development Department Director, the applicant in this case. This comes to you after having gone to the Planning Commission and reported out unanimously by them. It is an amendment to work that you previously did. You already amended the Antelope Valley Redevelopment Agreement for the initial phase of what the developer wanted to do in the area. But the developers now had, I think, two new thoughts. One, the market may be even greater than what they were prepared to do at that time. And secondly, if they could build some buildings at the same time with the ones that you've already seen and approved, there would be an efficiency because of the proximity of what they want to do. This amendment basically says, could we alter the description of the area to include two new buildings that were previously thought of as perhaps the next phase, but to put them in this phase so that the developer has the option of building as efficiently and as possible. They uh, are here and here. This is O Street, this is L Street, M Street, and N Street. You would have seen this building and this building before. 
But I think the best way to see this is the visual look from O Street down this area because while this has already been approved as part of the design, they'd like to add an accompanying building here. And if they could arrange to be able to build them simultaneously, they think that would be more efficient. Not quite on the same level of preparation as a building that would be back here, but the uses are essentially the same uses you've seen before. We're looking at um, first floor retail and above that uh, essentially housing. So this building, which would like, we'd, they'd like to have added, is called Telegraph Lost West. It would be 96 residential units in about a five-story building and accompanying parking. And then south of that, which would be Telegraph Lost's Lofts South, that would be looking at 84 residential units in a four to five-story building. It should look pretty familiar. If you had looked ahead for future phases, you would have seen these ideas but the developer would like to have the option to consider wrapping this into the redevelopment agreement that we're now working on and that in the event we're successful, you should see perhaps in September. Questions? Are there questions I can answer? I have one. Um, well, as we look at that picture, um, what intersection is that? Is that 21st and N? Yes. Okay, so just a, kind of a general question, has an understanding or agreement been reached with the business that currently exists at that corner? An agreement hasn't been reached. Conversations are occurring. It's between, it's the matter of finding a willing buyer and a willing seller. There's a willing buyer. The question is, is there a willing seller? They'd like to be able to proceed with the notion that if that was successful, they could proceed with this uh, project in this order so that they could then get the building efficiencies. If they can't, they can't. John? Could you go back to the schematic you first showed us of the various buildings in this district? Sure. And I was a little confused um, when you pointed, I thought you were pointing out not the one where the car wash is, but to the uh, east or west of it. But this? Yes. And I think this is in the Fisher Foods area. This is the Telegraph East building. It's already been part of what you've already previously approved. Yeah, that's what I thought. The pieces that you've approved include the boundaries. Mm -hmm. They include the uses, and they include these buildings. Okay. Today, you're being asked about these buildings. Thank you. And with the architecture on the uh, lofts south there, it, it really didn't show anything other than kind of a facade. Would it be complementary then and, and you materials? You can anticipate or? because of the integrated design that this developer went out and got a national uh, uh, design team to, us to help them with it. They're not showing that picture. That one is not as clear to them as this mirror image, which is just front and center in their views at the moment. Uh, there's no doubt that the work in the area will have integrated themes, building materials, design elements, signage, and the like throughout the entire Telegraph District. And then finally, just where is the proposed parking to supplement these? Residential facilities. If you were sure, if you were to say, if you were to, I'm going to mess myself up here a little bit, but where I have cross hatched here, 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 and here are all places that um, surface parking or street parking uh, should be part of the project. I would say that at the ultimate or the zenith of build out, it would be the developer's preference to have a garage on site someplace in that area, but that's not part of our current plan. Yeah. When you mentioned there was gonna be retail on the first floor of those two structures, and we if you have that. that, but if it is shared with the on-street parking with the residences, then- On-street parking is first come, first serve. Carl. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Landis, could you put that last one back up again? Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. So this is a comprehensive plan conformance, and obviously we've already uh, seen that what's come before is in conformance, and this is just continuing along that same path. I think I counted something like 302 total residences that are part of 
of what's proposed here, and that's, that's important. Uh, and then the other new piece that you haven't talked about is, is the Muni building. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to say about that uh, I don't have a, a, a final report on that score. It continues to be part of our conversation. Um, but we, this is a fluid process about what the developers are prepared to do. Mm -hmm. uh, another fluid uh, part of that same thing is what will we sell and when? And that includes the land that we own. But one of the topics of continuing concern is what's the ultimate disposition of the uni building and its use? I don't have a final and firm answer for that question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other questions? Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 11, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition of claims set forth for the period of June 16 through 30, 2017. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Okay. Next item, please. All right. If not, we can move on to our public hearing, ordinances, second reading, and related resolutions. I'll call items 12 through 14 together. They are Comp Plan Amendment 17005, amending the 2040 Comp Plan to change the future land use plan designation from open space and commercial to industrial and agricultural stream corridor on property at North 70th and Arbor Road. Change of zone 17016, application of Lincoln Sports Foundation for a change from H2 Highway Business District to I-1 Industrial at 7620 North 70th Street. And approving a development and conditional zoning agreement between Lincoln Sports Foundation and the city to construct an industrial park slash warehouse development under the proposed change of zone of the property from high, uh, H2 Highway Business to I-1 Industrial. Council members, Andrew Willis, Klein Williams, um, 233 South 13th Street here in Lincoln on behalf of the applicant. Um, Ultimately, the, the applicant here is Almond Opportunity LLC. They've entered into a written purchase agreement with the um, owner, the current owner the, of, the, of two parcels, the Abbott Sports Foundation and the Lincoln Sports Foundation, owning the two adjacent parcels, uh, with the desire to redevelop the property, construct an industrial development park warehouse development in this area. Um, the change of zone, the, the three pieces here obviously are combined. Um, the change of zone is necessary for the proposed development. Um, it's currently an existing, the, the primary piece we're looking at today is it's an existing H2 Highway Business Zoning District, um, and we'd respectfully request we change the zone to the I-1 Zoning District, which allow some additional uses, the main one being uh, industrial warehouses and the warehouses, the larger scale warehouses that would uh, we, we believe are a uh, very compatible use in this area. It's, it's surrounded by industrial. Um, it's the, it, it seems to be the longest, best term use of this area. Um, and that would allow for the, the, the full build out and the complementarity of, of that industrial zone. Um, the, the, the comprehensive plan piece, again, is it's currently there's, there's green space and some other, some other um, future land use items based on the, the current Abbott Sports Complex use. And uh, with the, the plan and the purpose of turning this into industrial, those, those future uses don't make a lot of sense, and, and so that's why the change of the, the future land use would, would um, we'd be requesting or industrial, sorry. Um, the, the industrial piece, we really feel like we're, there's a filling a need in Lincoln. There's a, there's a need for larger industrial buildings and warehouses. Uh, this site is surrounded by industrial. It's got good access to, the, to major highways, um, and really, it really fits in well. Um, the applicant doesn't have a concrete plan at this moment for the current for, for the user, but um, as part of industrial development, what happens is they need to be essentially you need to be out in front of this. An industrial user won't wait for any any, any development the going through this process. They want the space when they want the space, and, and if it's not available, to move on to some other place or some other town. So um, that's that's kind of the importance of having the change of zone in place even though we don't have a current user lined up um, this 
we have recommended recommended approval from planning staff and six one six to one recommendation from the planning commission. I understand, and you're going to hear a lot of concerns from the current users of this of the sports complex. Um, it's a tough situation that we're in, um, but ultimately, I guess what I would say is denying the change of zone doesn't doesn't uh, ensure that the current use will be will exist. This was uh, the current owner has put this up for sale. Um, they, they've been through several, they've, they've made several attempts prior to even putting it out on the market to, to get a viable option for the sports complex, and I don't represent them, so I can't speak totally to that. But ultimately, after several failed attempts last fall, they finally put it out as a, as, as for, for sale as just any use, and, and that's where my client came along this March and signed a purchase agreement. So we're currently, there's a purchase agreement signed. Um, and this is the, again, this is the our desired use uh, for development and what we think is the best long-term use. Um, with that said, without a current, without a current um, user lined up, we really want to do our best as far as at least a short-term solution to help out the current tenants. And so um, there is the the con development and conditional zoning agreement that's in place. I'd like to um, propose a motion to amend that. And what the developer is trying to do ultimately is, while they're still keep going, while we're still, um, you know, the the long term goal and the and the goal is to you is to develop an industrial complex. The short term, uh, we'd like to. Work, the, the developer is willing to work with the tenants, have a conversation, figure out what they can do, keep them in there as long as possible until the use is not compatible. The development and conditional zoning agreement that was that was in front of you prior had um, the main condition was this condition 2A, which said um, that the the youth sports the youth sports uses could not continue past the end of this year in the I-1 district, and it was all premised on 300 feet away from an industrial use as well. The current amendment, uh, the change in, in the amendment that I just proposed, uh, we've been working with the uh, legal staff and planning department on this. And this would allow um, those youth recreational uses to continue indefinitely as long as within 300 feet we did not have an industrial use that had a certain uh, use or storage or manufacture of those of those chemicals that are listed on that table and that are listed in the, uh, you know, that are the, uh, the hazardous materials that they're trying to, trying to keep that spacing. So this, this allows at least a more tempor a temporary solution. It's still a short-term solution for, for, the, for the tenants, um, but uh, the developer's goal would, would, again, to be to have the conversation, hopefully work something out in the short term, but with the goal ultimately is, is to develop this as an industrial warehouse, um, industrial warehouse park. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Questions? John? Well, regarding, and thank you very much, Mr. Willis, for outlining this for us. Regarding this amendment, uh, when you talk about hazardous materials and talk about chemicals and so forth, which I can appreciate due to the sports nature with uh, young people, are you saying that within that 300 feet, if you had other, just say, in it, storage of furniture in a warehouse, that then they could continue? It's just the hazardous nature that at that point there would be a process to relocate. That's correct. This, and this is the, uh, I believe this is the either identical or very similar language that's in the PD of the Sporting Village. And the idea is um, the hazardous materials, it's really premised on those hazardous materials because if with the, with the youth sports nature, if there was to be, you know, a situation where there'd be an evacuation or, you know, something, a, a spill or, or whatever, whatever that environmental condition would be, that's where the concern would be. So that's why there, if, if, if that, if within 300 feet of the youth sports, uh, there was a use that was on one of those listed chemicals of the of the threshold amount, that's what would trigger that. So if it was another commercial use, there wouldn't be the same impact. There wouldn't be the same danger. So that wouldn't that wouldn't trigger the well, yeah, the condition. Furniture as an example. Yeah, yeah. Furniture. There, there wouldn't be. So there wouldn't be. A, there wouldn't necessarily be that trigger that would would mean youth sports couldn't and stay there. As I looked at it, I don't know that I saw anything about a notice, so like a 30 days notice, or how, what. Of course, you're not going to necessarily develop something that quickly, but yeah, there is nothing in there. I, I, I mean, the there's currently leases in place, and my client's intent all, all along has been to you know maintain and, and honor those leases, but they run through the end of October. Um, again, these are all conversations that have not been had yet, but the idea would be a month to month kind of month to month tenancy, so that the notice would really be a month. But that's 
there's nothing in here. That's just kind of, I think, what the anticipated discussions would be. Other questions for Mr. Willis? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify in favor of this item? Would anyone like to testify in opposition to this item? And if you want to testify, please come up front. Hello, uh, Jason Anderson, 3446 River Circle here in Lincoln. I'm a parent of youth who participate there at the Abbott Sports Complex currently. Uh, I've lived in Lincoln for 18 years. During that time, I've been to Abbott for a lot of different activities and events. Um, to lose this area for youth sports in Lincoln and the surrounding communities would be a bad thing. If we change it to an industrial use, we're not going to get it back ever to be used completely as youth sports the way it is now. Um, a lot of stuff has happened since it came to light that Abbott needs help and that the complex needs people to come forward in order to save it. There's a lot of movement to make this work. Uh, I would hope that the city would, would find a way to keep this active, to keep it going for the youth. Uh, we really don't need more industrial space from what I can see. There seem to be a number of, of spots in town where there is industrial space that has openings. Uh, where there's other space available that could not be used as a green space for youth activities that would be available. And uh, the same reasons that uh, they stated that it would be good for industrial use are the same reasons why it's great for youth sports. It's close to, to the interstate. Uh, it's, it's served Lincoln since 1994. It is a, a great place for youth to participate in sports, and we need to find a way to make this work. Um, I would imagine within the next three to five years, we're going to be looking for how we can build more court spaces, more soccer fields, more baseball fields, and where are you going to find that land? It's going to be on the outskirts, just like what this is. So saying that it's not good for youth sports now uh, is not a valid argument. Um, I don't know where we would find space like this that would serve youth the way that Abbott does currently, and, and I would just ask that you do not allow the zoning change to happen so that youth sports can continue and a, another solution can be found. Okay, are there questions for Jason? Jane? Um, Mr. Anderson, you said that several things have been, I guess, developing since uh, the, the potential sale has come to light. Are you aware of the groups or organizations that are working together? Are you a member of one of the groups that are trying uh, I, to I am working with a group that is helping to, to make plans, to work with current tenants, to find potential donors. Uh, and there, there are a number of people who are interested in saving Abbott. Some of them who have already been very vocal and others who are kind of waiting to see what happens and what opportunities exist. Okay. Is your group work, working under a, a timeline on when they think they might have like a business proposal or business um, we, plan? We've or? already submitted one. We, we've come up with an initial draft that we submitted to the Abbott Foundation. Um, and at this point, we're, we're just waiting for an opportunity to, to be able to move forward and try to do more. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Now, Jason, you and I have known each other for pretty much the 18 years you've been here. Yep, that's true. And, uh, you have a passion for youth. You want to tell the council what you do as a profession? Uh, I work for the Boy Scouts. Um, pretty much everything I do involves working for the benefit of youth, uh, also working with the adults who work with the youth to make sure that you know, they're, they're prepared, they have the resources needed, and can help make sure that our, our youth turn into participating citizens as they grow up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to testify on this item? My name is uh, Pat Thomas. I'm on the board of directors for the Lincoln Sports Foundation, and I'm also in charge of the Abbott Motocross facility. <clears throat> um, first of all, as this has kind of progressed, it, it started with a buyer that would want to keep the complex operating as a youth sports complex. That's the premise we agreed to when we agreed to sell it. <clears throat> Since then, that's kind of gone out the door. Well, we've come to them with, to Abbott with solutions and buyers with comparable 
um, offers to keep it a youth sports complex. Actually, at the motocross track, we didn't even know we were for sale until a little less than two months ago. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> two months ago. So we had been taking grant money from the county as early as, late, as, as, early as last year, making improvements to the track. Uh, making it better, you know, and working with our government partners, doing what we said we were going to do. And now we're pulled into this sale. So we're kind of caught off guard. But as a board <laughs> from Lincoln Sports Foundation's viewpoint, we do not agree to this sale. The, the signature on the purchase agreement and the signature on the zoning change were not properly authorized by our board. So they're not valid. So <clears throat> our standpoint is we don't want to sell. We got partners ready to help and we're ready to go. So um, there's things filed with the Register of Deeds that we are representing that say that it'll stay as complex forever. Um, and that's all public record. You guys can look at all that. But we as a board have, I feel, been kind of bullied into this sale and not exactly been honest to us about everything involved. And so all along, maybe we've had some money problems, but we've got a lot of kids out there that don't pay. And we don't want their money because they don't have it. And they can't afford to go across town. We got one group, we don't take fees from them so that they can afford to buy a bus to get their kids out to play basketball. Those are the kind of things we're doing. And so I don't know if we have a big legal leg to stand on or not, but if you have any questions you want to hear from, you know, this guy's saying he represents Lincoln Sports Foundation Board. I've never met him before in my life. And he's representing me on this zoning change? I mean, we're getting railroaded. So I just thought it'd be really important to let you all know what's really going on. So. Questions for Mr. Thomas? Hey, so who owns the mortgage on the property well we can't we don't know we've requested it and they say they can't find it okay and they haven't tried to collect for over 14 years so I mean we've we've literally bent over backwards to try to meet with them at the motocross track we had to threaten to leave before we could get a half hour lunch meeting with them they haven't even been out to see all the beautiful improvements that we've made to the track with the with the uh, taxpayers' dollars from the county. I mean, we've done a lot of good out there, a lot of positive impact. We've made <clears throat> a lot of really big relationships with AMA and other big entities that it takes years to gain their trust before they'll give you big events that have that giant economic impact. Well, now... How do we look now? I mean, five years into it, everybody's scheming and lawyering up and planning on how to, how to get rid of it. I mean, it doesn't settle with me to take tax dollars and, and money out of my own pocket and blood and sweat from my family to make this thing better. Also, some guy can come along and kick us out. It's, it's, it's obvious he's not going to keep it a motocross track. He's going to get rid of it just as soon as he can, along with the rest of it. And he's going to tell you everything that we want to hear. And it's just, and if you want to know the truth, call me. Talk to me. I'll tell you everything that's going on out there straight up. So I guess if there are any questions. Yes. Well, thank you for your testimony. I'm looking here at the our fact sheets we have and it appears the applicant for the zoning changes was Almond Opportunity LLC. I don't see the Sports Foundation on here. 
Yeah, that we own the property. I would think we would have to make that application. I mean, that's the buyer. He doesn't even own it yet. So I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just. Okay. Well, I was confused in your testimony yeah. because you were pointing at the. Uh, well, he'd come up here saying that he represented the seller. We're the seller, LSF. They deeded the property to us in 2004. According to the papers I found at Register of Deeds, okay. and which we, we sent all that to you guys today, a lot of that. Emailed it to you guys. Okay. We may not have gotten all of it yet. We've been in meetings. Been apologize. I apologize for that. I've, I, we didn't even know we were for sale. So, I've, you know, I, I'm an excavating contractor, so I'm not the most polished guy, but um, I work hard, you know, and I don't give up, and, and I ain't going to quit on these kids, you know. I appreciate your patience, Mr. Thomas. Oh. Well, so you're a board member of the Lincoln Sports Foundation. Yes, sir, I am. And you said the Lincoln Sports Foundation is the owner and it's the seller. Yes. So if you're on the board, I would assume at some point you had a meeting that the board decided to sell? Um, in our bylaws, in order to take action without an official meeting, the president of the board has to have unanimous agreement which is all five board members he did not do that and 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 all defense of him we didn't realize the gravity or, or look at the bylaws but we did not have an official meeting with minutes distributed to the boards board members for them to make an educated decision on what they're voting on they did the online or the on the phone thing and when you do that you have to have all five I've never voted for it. So you're one of five board members, and so you're saying, did you, did you even have a chance to vote on the phone? No. I said I didn't know what I was, I wanted to have a lawyer look at it because I'm not a lawyer. I'm not gonna sign something unless somebody looks at it. So there, there was a phone conversation then to ask for your vote, and then you just yes. declined to uh, vote? Email. Okay. Documented, yep. So do you know what the other four board members, how they responded? I don't, no, I don't. I just know that in order for him to take that action legally under the laws that we've organized under the state of Nebraska as a 501c3, he's not authorized to take that action without all five board members in agreement. When it's not done in a meeting? Yes, sir. When it's not done in a formal meeting, so. Do we have anyone here today that can help clarify what happened on that email vote? Other than um, yourself? I don't. Well, that's what happened. They didn't. They didn't have all five. I was the. I was the fifth that held out. So the. So so the. According to our lawyer, that signature is not not any good. Because he did lawyer, not have authorization to make it. And who is your lawyer? Uh, John Soul. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? All right. If you have, when I call for somebody to testify, you got about five seconds to stand up, or I'll call and go on to the next right. item. Okay. <laughs> Apologize, sir. All right. My name is Jim Bavard, uh, 3435 South 79th Street here in Lincoln. Uh, we've lived here since 2005. We moved up here from the Topeka, Kansas area. My children have essentially grown up at the Abbott Sports Complex. Our first sports activities, uh, youth sports activities were through Abbott and continue to be so now. I'm an ass assistant coach with the Cornhusker Shooting Stars Basketball Club and I run Team Extreme Soccer uh, as well and we utilize some of the space out there at Abbott. I, I, other than my kids participating, I'm not formal, I'm not a tenant of, of Abbott, I'm, a, I'm a essentially a concerned citizen with this. Um, I, I spoke a few weeks ago in front of the Planning Commission. I was also uh, one of the individuals who's been quoted in the newspaper uh, recently, the stories revolving around Abbott, as well as being interviewed by a couple of the, the TV stations. So uh, I've been involved. I, Mr. Anderson spoke a few minutes ago. I'm part of that group that uh, Jason has been a part of as well. So the Planning Commission vote a few weeks ago was black and white, and we, we understand the, the result of that, and we appreciate Chris Hove's uh, dissenting vote for this. I feel like the City Council, though, has an opportunity to, to look at it a little broader. Uh, this really isn't about, to me, this isn't about the tenants and whether they have 30 days or whether they have an indefinite period. It, it, it's really about Lincoln, what Lincoln needs. 
I am involved in competitive youth sports uh, as a parent and, and as a coach, and so I travel the country. In fact, I just came back from Louisville, Kentucky, where we spent a week and a half at AU basketball tournaments uh, and, and marveled, frankly, at the facilities that we competed in. Uh, they're, they're fabulous, and we go around the country and see plenty of fabulous places, and we come back to Lincoln, and Lincoln doesn't have one. We go to Ames, Iowa, a far smaller community that has far superior facilities than what Lincoln has. So this is about Lincoln and not about the tenants. It's also about the location of, of the facility and the, the type of, of athletes and the type of community members that the facility serves. As uh, Mr. Thomas spoke a, a moment ago, a number of the, the participants at Abbott activities are underprivileged. It's, it's the poor kids. It's the disserviced. Uh, and most of the organizations out there do have mechanisms by which we allow those kids who need the assistance, who need the positive environment to, to come and, and learn those life skills and, and to, to benefit from the structure that these types of activities provide to youth. That's not something that, will, that really can operate in the, the Speedway Village. Frankly, the price structure, uh, it, it, Speedway is fabulous. It's a, it's a nice new indoor soccer facility. I love it. I love going to, pay, to play there. I can't, as a soccer administrator, I can't afford to use that for practice. It is cost, I will not sleep at night passing on that, coast to, that cost to my parents. When we're a volunteer organization, we operate at cost. And I have about 150 kids, uh, about 10 teams that we operate. In soccer, it's it's north. It's a little bit north side versus south side, but for the most part, people who are in Lincoln, south side will come up north, and north will go down south. But we also, especially the Shooting Stars, especially VCN, the Volleyball Club Nebraska, uh, and the Nebraska Juniors, we draw in kids from all over the state. And the proximity to the highway is a key selling point of our of our locations. We bring we have kids who come in from Kearney to come in for practice. And especially those kids in Wahoo and Waverly and Ashland that currently come to us, Abbott goes away, they're not going to Southwest Lincoln. They're going to Omaha. In fact, I, I specifically had three parents tell me that this morning on the phone. One, one minute. Okay, thank you. As Jason said, after the Planning Commission, we put forward a proposal we, to the Abbott Foundation to operate the, the facility. They were told this was a great idea, this is something we wanted three years ago, but there's no money attached. So that day we raised $930,000. Commitments for $930,000 of the two million that we propose is necessary to, to, to take over the, the, the operations, ignored. And the Babbitt Foundation is aware of, of what we raise and who it came from. We also found a second buyer, buying group, that was willing to match the, uh, the current offer and to continue operating it as a youth sports complex. Also ignored. Okay. We were told to dissolve our committee because it's going to cost a lot of people a lot of money. We were told to focus our efforts in partnering with Speedway. Well, that's too expensive. And frankly, Lincoln needs both. We need more, not less. We were told by a number of people, too, that the Speedway completion of the second building is on hold until Abbott goes away. And please wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. You know, at this point, this, is, this should be more about Lincoln than, more than about the tenants and the money being exchanged with us. This is something that I would hope that the city council would, would be in favor of maintaining this 25-year commitment to the community. So thank you for your time. Okay. Any questions? Jane? Yes. Um, Mr. Boviard? Boviard. Boviard. Um, are you part of the coalition working with Mr. Anderson? Yes. Because he's soccer, you're basketball? Um, I actually coach Jason's daughters in, in both sports. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we are two, uh, two members of the group. Okay. Is the motocross part of the we group? Have, to yes. Yes, Craig together. Fritz, uh, who's also part of the, uh, is also he's one of the, the motocross representatives, and he's part of our group as well, as well as a representative from Lincoln uh, Elite Gymnastics, uh, the CrossFit Oxano that utilizes the, the former tennis center, or at least the, 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 the gym part of the, the tennis center. So has your group submitted uh, an official formal counterproposal? Is that... 
for their we consideration? Were, we or? were told, as I said, this is great, but there's not. This is something we would have liked to have seen three years ago. We didn't know until three weeks ago that this was necessary. They said it's great, no money attached. So we called the people that we knew were already on board. And said, can you give us a firm commitment that we can communicate to the Abbott Foundation? And they did so. And as I said, we raised nine hundred thirty thousand dollars, and that was provided to the Abbott Foundation, who those individuals were. In addition to that, um, there are there are other contributors that I'm, I'm frankly not at liberty to say they want to remain anonymous until there is something to actually contribute to. There is money to to provide the the facelift that the facility needs, as well as ongoing maintenance. And did you mention there is uh, an additional buyer out there? Or? There's a second buying group. Okay. At this point, because of their, their other business, if nothing's going to come of this, they will remain anonymous. But at the moment that there's an opening, there's a second buyer that, again, has come about through our work over the last three weeks. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, are you suggesting that your group needs additional time to consolidate an offer? Or uh, Frankly, we need this. <laughs> We need the current sale. We either need the Abbott Foundation to be willing. Uh, uh, while Lincoln Sports Foundation is the is the owner of the property, the Abbott Foundation is negotiating on its behalf. So it is the the Abbott Foundation who is who is is driving this sale right now. Okay. If they are willing to continue talking to us, we can consolidate fairly quickly. If there is an opening, we have commitments that. You know, we can move forward with this. Okay. But at this point, that opening isn't there. And so other, the sale has to s stop otherwise. If the zoning isn't passed, it's not of interest to the buyer. Then the Sports Foundation would support a, a second buyer. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I do. Cindy? So, thank you for coming tonight. So, I, and I'm trying to be clear, are you, you are or are not a member of the Sports Foundation Board? I am not a member okay. of the Sports Foundation Board. Okay, and um, have you been working, though, at the Abbott Sports Center since 2013 or earlier? I have been a, a parent patron of the, of, the, of the programs operating out of, this, of the Abbott Foundation. Okay. Or out of sorry, the Abbott Sports Complex. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you all. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Very well, Mr. Willis. Would you care for a rebuttal? Thank you. Um, a couple things. Um, the first piece. Um, yeah, just just to clear, clarify, I don't represent the Lincoln Sports Foundation. I represent the buyer. Um, the we have agreements signed by the president of the Lincoln Sports Foundation. Both the change of zone application that was filed was signed by the president. That we have purchase agreement signed by the president. The original development and conditional zoning application, which we've proposed to amend today, we have a, a draft of that signed by the president of the Lincoln Sports Foundation. I can't speak to the procedure behind that, but as of as I'm standing here in front of you, we have all of those documents signed by the Lincoln Sports Foundation, um, by the president of of that foundation. Um, the other the other piece of the property is owned by Abbott's at, at the Abbott's Foundation, and they also have the the mortgage and 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 some relation. I'm not totally completely you know knowledgeable with with the Lincoln Sports Foundation. Um, roughly, you know. This, this has been, they've tried to market this as a youth sports complex for, you know, my understanding is from sometime in early 2015, they started working uh, to talk to local groups, um, see if they could sell this, you know, just basically, basically give away the property and have somebody put in the money to maintain this. Um, they were unsuccessful. The second step that they really took was looking at youth sports organizations more na nationally, more regionally, and again, found no buyers. It was only last year, around Thanksgiving, I believe, when they put it on sale just on the open market for, for any use. Uh, my client then, so that would have been, I think, roughly Thanksgiving of last year. This year in March, 
uh, we entered into a purchase agreement. So uh, there's been a, a lot of time where things have not happened. At this point, we now have a purchase agreement signed. Um, we've put down non-refundable money. Um, the, the property is still zoned H2 currently. So if this change of zone is not passed, it limits the, the primary limitation on the overall complex would be the uh, sort of industrial warehouses, but there is still commercial development that can go on. I don't think it's accurate at this point to say that the sale doesn't go through if, if the change of zone isn't passed. Um, again, there's non-refundable money down and this is, it's still a d developable property. Um, that said, again, my client still wants to at least provide a, hopefully provide a short-term uh, get into a conversation on the short-term uses. Um, but denying this change of zone will not, will not keep the, the youth sports, um, the current use. Uh, again, this is a conversation that between owner and, and tenants that, that apparently has not happened until after the planning commission meeting. And um, I guess from our perspective, we're, we have a signed contract and we're pretty far down the road. Um, so it's, yeah. John and Jane. Oh. Well, thank you, Mr. Willis. I was looking at some correspondence we had had earlier, too, from Doug Leineman, who's president of the Ethel, Ethel S. Abbott Foundation and recites a number of things on the efforts to try to uh, shore up the financial elements because the foundation or Ethel Abbott uh, Foundation is a, uh, was a lender of funds mm, and says it wasn't the owner that was the sports foundation. You mentioned you've got a signed agreement and you put down non-refundable funds, but it was signed by the president of the Lincoln Sports Foundation. I know typically when you deal with a corporate entity or a non-individually owned entity, you get some type of a letter from the board of directors or whomever certifying that that president in this case has authorization to sign. It was something like that executed? Well, I, I'm not I'm not positive the answer to that. Usually, you know, prior to closing, we would get something that would yeah have the the board's authorization. Uh, it's not necessarily done at this point. Um, so I I don't know the answer to that at at this point. My assumption has always been this has been done appropriately. We've got multiple documents and multiple um, items signed by them. Um, and and, the and pr pr prior to closing, would have some sort of you know consent minutes from the from the board or something like that. That's typical. So. Um, uh, this is the first I've uh, um, heard but, there might be a discrepancy. <laughs> well, since we have a board member here who said yeah. he was one of five that, uh, and we won't vote on this for a week, so I think that that might be something that would be very critical if you could verify that and provide it to us, because uh, I, I could bring out a number I, of I would think that would be easy to, easy to verify in, in the next week what the procedure was. I don't know what their bylaws say or, or what the procedure is required, but that should be, a, that should be an easy um, clarification to provide to the council. And I would think week. if, for, uh, assuming there wasn't adequate uh, authorization for the president to sell and execute those agreements, that that would void the contract and so the money would have to be returned in that case, whatever was put down. Be Not that I'm try you're trying to be a lot of problems it. then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that is a critical element that's come up today and to the extent you can, I would encourage you let us know too, so we can take that into our thought process here in the next few days. We should be able to verify that, I would assume, very easily. Um, I, I concur with Council Member Kemp. I, I am concerned because we just received some uh, handout uh, saying that they, there are concerns about whether the board meeting was held and if it followed their bylaws to give the appropriate authorization to that president to sign. I guess I was a little bit surprised. I, I was unaware that Abbott Motocross is also part of the transaction, and uh, boy, I thought, um, as a ca former county commissioner, I think we had a substantial investment in Abbott Motocross, as well as a lot of grant funding and obligations uh, for the grant funding. And I can clarify that, too. So there's, okay. there's first of all, there's two purchase agreements, I and I forget the exact delineation. I think that the Motocross piece is owned by the Abbott Foundation, and this the, ch the piece that we're proposing to change the zone on is owned by Lincoln Sports Foundation. But either, whatever the delineation is in the purchase agreement, it's subject, again, it's subject to, there's that motocross easement through 2030, I believe. And so this wouldn't change, the, the, I, this wouldn't change the, the use, the current leases that are in place. Um, so yes, they're, they're, the, the, the 
the change of zone request is not on the motocross site, and the goal would be to you know to honor that. I believe it's a I think it's a e easement, not a lease. I can't remember exactly, but it, but it's through 2030, um, and it's and the purchase agreement is subject to that, and and everyone's aware of that. And there was no intent to change that use. Okay. Other questions? Any? Yeah, I would like to talk about your proposed amendment and how that would affect the operation of the facility now. And, and also want to thank you for coming and helping us. Under mm -hmm. Would you go through that again? So if, if you have an amendment and it will do what to the existing programs in the building? So the, um, the change of zone to I-1, um, there's a concern from, from the city that the reason they don't want youth sports uses in the I-1 district is the potential hazardous uh, use the, the 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 conflict with the hazardous uses. So the development and conditional zoning agreement would allow the change to I-1 uh, while leaving the youth sports program the uses in place as long as within 300 feet of those uses, the user the the, the other tenants or the the user did not have. Um, either use or manufacture or store any of those chemicals on that list of hazardous chemicals in the amounts that are listed, and that's from the Code of Federal Regulations. So the idea would be that this conditional zoning agreement would allow the change of zone, which would allow uh, the buyer to begin that process of getting the industrial, uh, industrial development in place, but in the meantime, allow the youth sports to, to, main, to, to remain. Again, um, that's subject to other conversations. They need to figure out when these leases end, what the terms of the lease would be, and everything like that. But the but the development and conditional zoning agreement would be a mechanism that would allow those uses to, la to to remain until an industrial user that is incompatible was actually brought onto the site. So would it be fair to say that there, at some point there might be a dual use, both a warehouse storage and the youth programs continue? If, if, as long as it's not, as long as it doesn't have a hazardous material, I, I would, I believe, if if a, um, you know, just furniture, a furniture fu user, furniture, a furniture, store, yeah. a furniture um, warehouse came in, there wouldn't be an incompatible use, and so you could have that use uh, within that 300 feet limit. If anything's outside the 300 feet, let, that current building, for example, is 300 feet away from the the soccer field. So regardless of that use, that use, it wouldn't affect the soccer uses. It's mainly the volleyball and the basketball and the actual uses in that building but presumably if if they were using had a use that was non-hazardous and under that that scheme then even if it was within 300 feet there that wouldn't be incompatible okay mr willis if the council were to delay actions for a period of time two weeks a month would that negatively impact the buyer um I mean, yes, in the sense that they're trying to push this through fairly quickly. Again, the again because we're probably realistically this is probably and and I don't know this for sure. This could change, but you know, in a, in the big scheme of things, probably twelve months away from having anything mm -hmm. ready to be to be used. It's used, but if we don't begin that process now, if you, the longer we wait, the farther down the road it is. And again. The, this is the ultimate goal: um, is to is to redevelop that into industrial. So it would be, I mean, it would timing-wise, it would there'd be some negative. We're effect. not going to act on anything on this until next week. Next week, correct. And so, if between now and then you have some more insights on timing, would you please communicate that? To I, I will plan on yeah, trying to figure out the the foundation act, the consent or or that piece, and getting that back to you definitely prior to next week. I just wanted to, to follow up on that. I think it is important because I think in, in some of the testimony that you have provided that there is no identified potential uh, industrial user yet. And I understand that you know they will overlook this site if they don't have the initial zoning in place. However, I, I would concur that maybe there needs to be some delay to get some of the answers to our question beyond next week, as well as I would think to allow maybe uh, an opportunity to bring forward another offer if there is uh, a potential offer out there or a potential business plan on, on maintaining the sports complex. My at least as of now, my assumption is that this was validly authorized. Uh, that obviously there's been some conflicting testimony, so I can't speak to that right now. But assuming that this was validly authorized, um, then 
it wouldn't necessarily matter if there's a competing offer at this point because there's a contract in place. Mm -hmm. Now, if that big, you know, that big assumption is wrong, then, then, um, which I think we can figure out before next week. I think that that, um, all right, John. Yeah. And following up to what we talked about earlier, and I see Mr. Thomas had come forward, he won't be able to testify again, but as one of the board members, uh, he said there were five, I think just to be certain of everything here to eliminate the assumption element, if uh, you could find out from both the, pr from the president and then also find out who the other four, bo four board members are and get a response from them on what happened. And I suppose a copy of the bylaws or articles, whatever, that govern that so that you've got that. And if for some reason, if that verifies that everything was done right, so be it, you've got a valid thing. And I think we could potentially proceed. If there is something wrong there, then that would probably lead to a delay. But yeah. it, I think if we could do some here in the next day or two to get those things in order, that would be much better before we go ahead and do any further delay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'd like to get more information. Larry? Yeah, I appreciate your line of questioning and that information would be really vital yeah. to the council. And I would just say that, you know, if not delay, I think at least the continuation of the public hearing would make sense so that we could continue this discussion, uh, you know, I think that makes here. sense, yeah. yeah. That's good. What, what, what I'd make, I think, what, what Larry just, I'd make a motion. Well, we continue public hearing next week along with both, just so we know it's there and we'd have the opportunity to present something. Because this isn't in a voting session. Right. So I make that motion. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Cindy to include public testimony next week. Discussion? I support that. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Let's call the roll. <laughs> Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you, sir. And I will encourage anyone that has more information for the council that you can give it to a city attorney or the, uh, the clerk for the city council. Uh, next item, please. Next, then, are items 15 and 16. Change of Zone 17008, application of MJB Properties, Inc., and Charles and Mary Sherman for a change from R1 Residential to 03 Office Park on property generally located at 6969 South Street and 2215 South 70th Street. And item 16 is use permit 17005, application of MJB Properties, Inc. and Charles and Mary Sherman to allow for office and residential uses and related improvements with waivers from setback and frontage requirements on property generally located at 6969 South Street and 2215 South 70th Street. Good afternoon. My name is Kent Seacrest, representing Dr. Brad Alderman, who has a dentist office in Southwest Lincoln and would like to move his dentist office to this corner, which is the southwest corner of South Street and South uh, 84th Street. Uh, Dr. Alderman has also been working with the neighbor to the south, uh, Charles and Mary Sherman, and we have worked out what I call a kind of a master plan for the area. Uh, note, if you would, that there's four properties that have quite a bit of um, lack of density, is the word I would use. And under the new comprehensive plan, uh, we are looking at trying to fill in density to create more walkability. The comprehensive plan also supports local medical offices within residential areas. And so what we are, trying to do is create that sense of closeness so that you don't always have to travel as far in an automobile along the way. Uh, the Shermans are the property to the south. Brad Alderman's interest is this property. And we've worked and talked with the other property owners. They're not quite ready to talk about any more in density on their property, but we have done our master plan so we can continue driveways and development. Uh, the actual use permit itself, we are talking about two phases. The north property, again, which is off to your right, would be two medical type office buildings. And then someday when the Shermans are ready to leave their residence, there's two different versions. One is there could, they could also have three office buildings similar. I said two, I meant to say three for us, three for them or they might be interested in doing townhomes. 
uh, in this area. We had, uh, Tim Gergen is here to answer any of the questions that I'm not able to address, but what we're talking about with the Shermans are sharing a common a set of covenances, common access, common parking, common lighting, common design standards. So while there's two developers, they will be compatible and have an association take care of things along the way. We had a neighborhood meeting, 20 neighbors came. I think the general consensus was that uh, the office was a more desirable, quieter neighbor that tends to cut grass uh, better than any type of higher density might do. Um, the main concerns of the neighbors were on flooding issues, traffic issues, and buffering. I think we did a good job of addressing those issues. Uh, we still, uh, for example, we are now showing a turn lane in 70th Street, deacceleration lane to come into the property, uh, which I think will help the traffic flow. As John and others have pointed out, 70th Street has been in constant repair and so the neighbors are very sensitive because they really have not had a full network of uh, use for a while and so they were worried that we would impact that but I think Public Works came to the opposite conclusion that the network can support our development. The other final issue was flooding. Uh, our properties are again here and even off the map so this is a waterway that goes eventually into Holmes Lake. And what's happening here is part of the Army Corps of Engineer land is, has silted in, apparently, which then apparently backs up the water to the Chaucer Neighborhood Association. So um, just like 10 days ago when we had a one and a quarter inch rain, not a big rain, but a quarter inch, it started to come very close to their houses. Mm -hmm. So we have set up a Parks and Rec agreed today to have a meeting to try to look at the area so that we can be sure that we uh, are not going to back water up. Again, we're upstream. The problem is downstream. We're going to work with the city to try to clear it up so the water not only will not back up against the Chaucer Neighborhood Association, but won't back up on our property as well. So we have planning department's support and recommendation. We agree with all the conditions. And the Planning Commission voted to recommend conditional approval six to zero. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Seacrest? John, and then Larry. Mr. Seacrest, would you show your first drawing you had? Uh, I think it was the very first, uh, well, the, the schematic, the first one. The, yeah. the second one had the two options. And the two options? Well, no, that's the one I want, though. Okay. So that, that's really north isn't up north, north is to up the south street south 70th so okay. if that helps you well you know architects and engineers have taught me you got to have north at top so north that helps top now. <laughs> Thank so you. looking at so initially then to make this work the Shurmans would grant an easement for that access across its property correct and we're going to rebuild part of their driveway as part of the package right away so that they have a better circulation pattern to their residential home and that would not affect any other residents farther to the no. west? No. When I meant that we are master planning to the less dense areas to the west, we have access points here that we can connect so that someday those homes, those residences, when they redevelop, can use our access points along the way. And what's the distance for that access from uh, South Street? Uh, it does not meet current design standards. Uh, the agreement says that if this property over here develops, we will close ours and use that one and share access points. So I think it's like 200 feet. So about two thirds of us, 300 feet would be the normal access yeah, management, I, and this is 200 feet. I believe so. But you do a deceleration lane. For so, so on 70th is the deceleration lane. And that would be paid for by the developers? Developer, there. correct. Thank you. So this would give us the fifth year in a row of construction on 70th. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and just, I'm just giving you our yeah. You need to razzle me on that one. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Kent. Um, you mentioned three different concerns, and you've addressed sort of how flooding may... Oh, you know, flooded traffic. The third concern was there's a row of trees. Maybe it shows up. North 
up again. Am I doing this right? No. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's right. There you go. It's been a while. Anyway, there's a row of trees damp bound here that we've agreed not to disturb, except you know if they get diseased or die. Uh, this whole bottom area is flood, not formally mapped floodplain, but informally would be wet, and so we know this whole southern area will not be developed. So that's part of the buffering plan that our use permit shows with, to protect the neighbors. And could you put the map with the turn lane back up? Yes. Thank you. It's a little hard to see with all the lines, but it looks like that turn lane comes onto the property. It's not, you know, it, changing the layout of 70th Street per se. Could you elaborate on, on how the turn lane will work? Tim will correct me, but the turn lane itself is in the right of way, but we have to move the sidewalk and grant a city uh, sidewalk easement to get the sidewalk to <coughs> be put back and be a safe distance from the roadway. Okay. And another question about the, I mean, so R1 is, you know, has a really high standard for <laughs> um, changing zoning nearby, but could you speak about what the R1 uses are north of the property across South Street, because uh, that, that seemed relevant to the discussion. North? No, or maybe the planning department could, if, if you're not. Uh, I'm going to let Steve okay. handle that, because I'm not up to speed on, okay. was that a PUD or something? Uh, well, north of south. May I bring staff? Yeah, thanks. Steve Hendrickson with the planning department. Could I get the question again? This site is currently zoned R1, and it's mm -hmm. surrounded by R1. So, of course, that caught my eye in terms of you know investigating a change of zone. Um, could you speak about what other properties are around this one and why the planning department was supportive oh, of this change of yes, zone despite certainly. the R1 zoning? Yeah, so to the west is an adjacent one more long uh, property that it sounds like is sympathetic to perhaps looking at office zoning in the future and then next to it is a uh, equally long church lot. Um, so there's a fair amount of buffering in terms of the uses to the west. Uh, to the north there is a formerly residential house that's right on the corner, northwest corner. That has actually been purchased by the church, uh, the Church of the Nazarene. They have purchased several houses. One they have a daycare in and they put uh, parking lots in the backyard. So they have developed a very large uh, campus there um, on the northwest corner. And then to the east you have the four lanes plus center turn lane of 70th Street. So you have quite a bit of distance before you get to the R1 uses the townhomes to the east. So even though across the street to the north is R1, you you don't have residential Correct. Uh, There's living. Not residential. You have a parking lot, essentially. Is, is empty. The church hasn't quite yet decided what they were going to do with it. OK, thank you. All right, Jane. The question I had, and I don't know if it's Kent, Kent can answer it, or Tim, or maybe Steve. I noticed that there was a waiver granted for the zero feet setback. Tell me what that means. Um, Within our development, it's only within our development. It's not any waivers up against what I call third-party neighbors. So uh, we have our development, they have their development, so we're waiving the setback between ourselves. Okay. But not against any other neighbor that's not part of our development. Okay. Thank hey. you. And this one's for public works, so if maybe Mickey Esposito could come up. Or planning, I, I, it's about the access management policy. Uh, Director Esposito, Lincoln Public Works, and I actually will have to defer to planning on okay. this one. I have no knowledge of this particular site, so I might go ahead and ask Steve to help me, sure. if you don't mind. Thank you. The you question really is just the diversion from the access management policy. Why is it supported by the city, and is it because of the what was presented as a temporary Yes, that, use uh, of uh, <coughs> temporary diversion. Yes, th there's um, access on 70th Street. In a perfect world, you would have the access on 70th be a little further south, except you run right into the middle of the floodplain area, and we don't want to have the driveway head that far south. So it's not really f possible to move it further south. Uh, they did agree to put a turn lane in, which is part of uh, access management, is when there is an access to have a turn lane. 
And then likewise, though, it, we, rather than having no access on 70th Street and it just down south, it was even worse of an access in south in terms of it was even closer to the intersection on 70th. So, but yes, the access that they're going to have is temporary in the sense that if the office zoning does move further to the west, they've agreed to relinquish their driveway and take access through a, a development further to the west. And that would be a part of any request to rezone the property to the west. That'd be a condition that they provide access through their property to this property. And as you consider these um, exceptions to the policy, was there a traffic analysis or any sort of um assessment of the impact in case that uh, zoning to the west doesn't happen or in in terms of allowing the the turn lane does that have any noticeable impact on traffic on 70th street um, it was reviewed by my friend oh excellent <laughs> it was to say it was i didn't realize he was Hoskins, here i didn't mean so to put good. you on I'm the glad spot he's able to come up for that hiding in the back randy hoskins <laughs> assistant city engineer um, yeah, we did look at, at some traffic counts out there and see, try to see what impacts would, would happen as a result of placing these, these accesses here. Um, I think, you know, we looked at, at how much of a, a left turn stacking we have, um, both northbound and eastbound, because both of those were a concern, um, one for the 70th Street and one for the South Street driveway. So we did look at those. Um, as Steve was saying, we're this is not great and obviously it doesn't match up with the policy but I think in the end we felt these are both existing driveways um, by getting the agreement that they would move it west if something happens in the future by getting the turn lane on south um, I think we felt that this is so you're not important. making it worse off because they're existing driveways is what you're saying Correct. and in, it helps to make it better in the future if you've got the agreement to to close that access contingent on zoning changing to the west. That is correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Just to make sure I'm clear looking at this, so are you saying the 70th Street access would be closed and it would just, everything would come from the west, or you would add, you would close the closer one on the north side there and move it farther west? The latter, that's right. This Close the south street access the point south, and move south that west. The south 70th would remain regardless. Mm -hmm. And then the one yes. you have up there at the top, yeah, right there, that would be closed and move closed farther with, west. What they're showing here is that there's a, a potential future driveway here that would link to an adjacent property. That adjacent property, this driveway would be closed. You'd move the driveway further to the west, and that would then lead to access into here. And is the access there on South Street, is, how close is that to the 70th Street intersection? Uh, looks like it's about 240 some feet. And the one going on South 70th is how far? Is that the 200 foot? Looks mm -hmm. farther. More than that. Yeah, well, probably a 270 foot turn lane there, so mm -hmm. probably three. Okay, I misunderstood Mr. Seekers. I thought he said 200. Okay, good. And, you're, and so as far as the 70th Street headed east, there would be no deceleration lane. That would just be fine to turn in. No, there's a huh? on the South Street on, on South North, Street coming from the west, um, going east. They just I think, have yeah, the I think right now that is that it's a, a two way left turn lane in there, and so. But if I'm heading west, I'm heading east on South. Oh, Street. I'm sorry. If you're heading east, no, you're correct. Go in. There would not. But be the idea there. being, then when they down the road, it would be moved, so that would be okay without the deceleration. Yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the problems, obviously, when you've got fairly narrow lots is if you want to put in a turn lane, now you're on the next guy's lot. And so okay. And then last point is on South 70th Street where you would say you're headed north and you're going to turn in to get to the access. I assume you'd permit that because there is that center lane that ultimately, I guess, becomes the left turn lane for at 70th and South. Uh, is there any change on the median there or that they've set it up so it would, you would turn before you would get to the stacking lane? Yes. Um, that that will again we looked at the at the northbound left turning movement there and determined that that would give us enough enough stacking space for that traffic that's turning left onto south street um, prior to them um, nope. you know not backing traffic out into the the through lanes of, of 70th street okay thank you other questions 
Thank you. Anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, I'll call items 17 through 21 together. They are Comp Plan Amendment 17006, amending the 2040 Comp Plan by revising the boundaries of the future land use, plan residential, green space, and environmental resources designation areas, expanding the future service limit, and changing the future growth tier designation from Tier 2 to Tier 1 Priority C, Tier 2 to Tier 1 Priority A, and Tier 1 Priority B to Tier 1 Priority A. Annexation 17005, annexing approximately 218.67 acres of property. An annexation agreement for Iron Ridge between the city, charter title, and escrow services. And Apples Way LLC regarding the city's annexation of property. Change of Zone 17012, application of Apples Way for a change from AG Agricultural to R3 Residential and change of zone 17013 application of apples way for a change from ag agricultural to r3 residential for a planned unit development district designation of said property and for a, a development plan which proposes modifications to the zoning ordinance land subdivision ordinance and design standards to allow up to 250 dwelling units in conformance with r3 zoning requirements and up to 50,000 square feet of commercial floor area and 200 dwelling units in conformance with B2 zoning requirements. This is all on property generally located at the southeast corner of the intersection of South 27th and Rokeby Road. Ooh. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council. My name is Tom Beckies with Apples Way LLC. Uh, speaking on behalf of the proposal, or should I say five proposals in front of you, uh, regarding uh, the uh, development of land generally located at 27th and Rokeby Street, Rokeby Road, excuse me. Um, a CUP on the west side of 27th Street, uh, comprising of about 66 acres, that will actually, uh, we're showing about 45 uh, residential dwelling units on that piece. And then a PUD on the east side of 27th Street that comprises of about 152 acres in total that will that we're showing about 192 single family residential living units on that piece. Um, in addition to that, we're showing um, residential and or up to 50,000 square foot of commercial on about 14 acres on the hard corner of 27th and Rokeby. That would be the southeast corner of the intersection. Um, the developer has agreed to pave Rokeby Road from 27th Street to about 31st Street. If you're familiar with Rokeby Road, there's a cemetery right at about 31st or 32nd and Rokeby. Uh, the developer has agreed to pave Rokeby Road from 27th Street up to that property line of the cemetery. Um, and then the developer has also agreed to contribute a uh, million dollars for 40th Street roadway improvements uh, to um, access, to improve some roadway there uh, in conjunction with some floodway issues, floodplain issues there. Uh, we're also proposing uh, the conversion of about 48 acres of space that currently sits within a conservation easement uh, jointly owned by the NRD and the City of Lincoln from row crop to a tall grass prairie uh, at right about 27th and Rokeby right there on the southeast corner between the commercial pad and what would be ultimately the single family residential of the PUD to the east. So it should be something actually <clears throat> hopefully very nice to look at as you drive across, down south 27th street. Um, I think we are proposing two changes that you'll be seeing for coming forward and correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, one, I think that you'll be seeing language in regards to the annexation agreement um, that, um, let me pull it up here. Concerning the South 27th Street water main installation and that the city will agree to the construction of that uh, water main uh, to occur within the fiscal year 2017-2018. Uh, um, and then I think that we'll also be seeing um, the developer
give it a couple seconds. Yep. So what we have here is the intersection of 27th Street with Rokeby. We've been working with our neighbor to the north, Lincoln Federal, to um, move an access point onto Rokeby Road that is currently positioned at about 29th Street. Our property is to the south. You'll see that that access puts us directly in the middle of a um, floodplain. We've been working with Lincoln Federal in the hopes to try to move that access point to about 28th Street or about 250 feet to the west. We've been unsuccessful at this point in time in reaching an agreement with Lincoln Federal to move that access point. Um, and so we are willing to um, try to make that access point work for our development, um, even though it will enter into the flood way. I've run out of time. You got one minute. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have. I know there's a lot of information here. And I have Tim Gergen and, and Post here with me as well. Okay, questions from Jane? Again, I was looking at the waivers, and um, can you explain the, the waivers that were uh, proposed? for um, the stormwater detention and as well as changing the block lengths? So, let's please, please introduce yourself. So. My name's Tim Gergen with Clark Anderson Partners, 1010 Lincoln Mall. Um, our waivers for block length are essentially the um, waivers that are abutting the floodplain. So the only block length waiver we have is along this drainage way, this tributary to Salt Creek, is that's where we're having to waive the block length. Um, it has since come to our knowledge that we don't need to ask for the waiver for block length where we have a natural barrier. So that waiver is really uh, a waiver we requested that's really not needed. And this, so all other development blocks are within the Lincoln standard for block lengths. The other one is the stormwater detention, and that's one where we are so close to Salt Creek. Here's Wilderness Park, Salt Creek here, that it actually makes better sense for flowage to let our stormwater get into the channel before the rest of the storm water develops. Salt Creek's a very slow watershed where if we have a, a large amount of rainfall, Salt Creek doesn't rise until the day, maybe two days after the rainstorm event. So what we need to do is where we have properties adjacent to Salt Creek, we want our storm water to get into the channel and out of Salt Creek through Lincoln before it starts rising up. The uh, storm water detention usually means we hold it for 24 hours. So if we would hold our uh, system for 24 hours, we'd be discharging our stormwater at the peak when Salt Creek is rising at its peak. So it's all a matter of functionality of time with the stormwater detention. Thank you. Other questions? Larry. Thanks for being here. I, I noticed in the staff report that there was back at planning, I believe, just um, some work still to do with grading and floodplain information and that the watershed management was waiting on that to complete the review. Has that been process been completed? It has. We've resubmitted the calculations and they've um, signed off on our resubmittal information. Okay, great. Thank you. And so it was a uh, tricky floodplain model that we were working with and updating their model. And so we had to trans transfer back models back and forth. And that's really what that information was. I'm going to ask the staff a bit about floodplain issues, but want to give you an opportunity to address them too. This is obviously a very complicated site with you just even the mention the access point that you've been trying to negotiate with the neighbor to the north. Can you talk about um, how you've gotten comfortable with this site given the, the, compl the complexity? Yeah, it's actually, um, we spent a good six months beforehand before our application working with the NRD and the site. Um, our conservation easement language with the city means we're not only increasing conservation easement by about an acre, we're also increasing the flood storage um, by, I want to say, oh boy, maybe 11 acre feet, uh, somewhere around there. Um, so what, by, by removing the row crop farming, we're going to take that area down, lower it by a couple feet, and so we increase the flood storage volume in this 
in this whole area and also turn it from row crop farming to na native prairie grass, which also lowers the amount of flow rate that comes off that conservation easement area. So it's actually a win-win for the development and for the city and NRD where we have a lot more flood storage volume, but also we return some of the property back to a native prairie, which would be beneficial for the, our development and the city of Lincoln. Thank you. You bet. Carl? Yes. Um, Mr. Gergen, could you move it to show a little bit east of the... Yeah. It look, looks like there's a detention pond down on the south part there. Will that... Yeah. That is a, an existing farm pond, if you will, and we're going to remain, uh, have that to remain. It really, a lot of the flowage into that farm pond is coming from not our property, but a little bit further east. Mm -hmm. So we have very little flowage going into that, so it doesn't really act as too much of a detention for our site. Okay. But we will be keeping that in place and, and utilizing that as a feature for the development. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Yeah. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. Oh, sorry, I have some oh. staff questions I would love to ask. Yeah, of planning. David Carey with the Planning Department and Steve Hendrickson is with me as my security blanket on this one. <laughs> Great. I'm glad to have both of you. I know you had to put in a, a, a lot of work um, all around to try and work out the complexities of this site. And, you know, of course, things about emergency access always catch my eye when it comes to floodplain issues and whether or not we can get emergency vehicles and to this will be residential in the future. Can you help us understand how the city has planning department has gotten comfortable with those access issues? And the second question is about um, what, what kind of lag time there will be between residential occupation and the construction of the future uh, fire station in the area anticipated right. lag time I mean, to what extent those emergency response times may be lagging well, behind standards the the one of the, the main points of consideration with this is as we got more comfortable with the proposal was the fact that um, the applicant was uh, able and willing to agree to um, provide additional funding up front uh, that will eventually be reimbursed over time with uh, uh, impact fees from their development to help along the improvement to South 40th Street. There's a bridge and related culverts um, that is also a concern for flooding at the current moment uh, and does need to be raised out of the floodway as well as the general overall improvement to the street. So uh, with that part of, of this proposal and this agreement, um, that is uh, basically the process of getting that improvement done uh, will be better ensured. As far as the exact timing of that improvement is what still needs to be worked out. Um, but what that additional funding does do for us is allows us to ensure that that improvement can happen in the near term. Um, that is related to how the flooding uh, with significant rain events happens on 27th Street and Rokeby Road with this development. Um, and so the, uh, the flow of water across Rokeby Road with the improvement that the, uh, the applicant and the developer have agreed to do with their, with their money that is not reimbursed is to pave that section of Rokeby Road at their cost without reimbursement, uh, which is a, uh, a significant point to be made. Plus, also, what that improvement does not do is raise that road to a point where that a full urban improvement would do. Um, so we have some of those concerns with, and which is why we focused on 40th Street as being the uh, n nearest term improvement to allow for that emergency access to during a, a significant rain event to be able to get to the site. Um, as far as the timing of the actual building of, of homes and occupancy and the timing of that improvement, um, I would have to either defer to Steve or to the applicant to kind of time that out for me. Um, but that is kind of the, the, the crux of what we, did, what we negotiated through this so that we have better assurance that emergency access can get there in a reasonable amount of time so that not all of those roads are flooded at the same time. Can you show us on drawings or a map where you expect the flooding overtopping the roads would happen and then where the plan B exists with this road improvement on 40th, just so we can understand how people would exit should those roads be impassable? Sure. Go ahead. Um, so on this drawing here, the floodplain is the kind of darker black line. You have 27th Street on the west, Rokeby Road on the north. So in a storm event, such as in May of 2015, 
uh, this part of 27th Street closed because it was overtopped by water backing up from Salt Creek. And also the concern is it would also then back up over Rokeby Road. So the emergency access, this there'll still be an access point to the subdivision over here at let's call it 32nd because it is outside of the flood plain. So people will be able to still get to Rokeby Road and exit east to 40th Street. Um, 40th Street, though, this same drainage way also currently crosses 40th Street. And so that is why we're trying to focus on getting the culvert sized and 40th Street improved so that you would not then also be blocked at 40th Street. Um, so again, as David mentioned, we don't exactly have the timing on 40th Street as to when that would be done. But we also have a different developer, uh, the Wilderness Commons and Wilderness Heights developers on east side, both sides of 40th Street. We already have an agreement with them to get uh, that road funded. Um, the city has some funds already set aside. We're just trying to get the last pieces there to see that we have enough funds. Uh, and certainly the $1 million being contributed by these developers, hopefully that'll get us there that we can get the improvement over on 40th Street done uh, in a much nearer term so that in the event that this, both 27th Street and Rokeby Road were closed, that you could exit out to Rokeby and then head north on 40th Street. So how com I mean, how comfortable are you then with the time? I mean, if that timing didn't play out to your expectation, um, what, what is the impact on people who live in that part of the development? Um, if, if 40th Street were also closed because we hadn't yet got the 40th Street improvement done, it would mean you would exit out to Rokeby over to 40th, and then you would have to head south one mile to Sotillo, and uh, then head over to 56th Street and continue on your way. Or take the South Bypass. Or, or take the South. <laughs> Hopefully it's not that long into the future before it is ready. Okay. I do, do to partially answer that question, yeah. too, is that at, at this point now it's going to be more incumbent on the city's part to when we look at the next version of the CIP and our capital programming of streets that we have to have that discussion about when we can fit that into um, the public works capital budget and that that's that would be the one of the more immediate next steps as far as as moving forward um, so that's something that we have to discuss as far as the exact timing of the project is it currently in the CIP but just further down or is it a brand new project for the CIP it would be a new project for the CIP but it's something that has had some funding um, set aside already, plus this additional infusion of a million dollars uh, loan up front will be part of that discussion to see where it can fit in. Okay. And then lastly, um, there's a condition that was struck on page seven of the um, zoning agreement, I think it is. Let me just look. It's condition 2.12. It's about notifying people who potentially live here about these complexities. And I just wondered what that discussion was since it was there and now it's crossed out what, what happened. And I'm happy to hear from both sides on that. But um, uh, Sure. It was basically that uh, Public Works thought it would be much more effective to have signage on Rokeby Road itself. Um, we have other places in town where there's a warning about warning low water crossing. Randy might know the the better term that will actually be put on the sign, but that was a more effective way for people driving on Rokeby to know that there's potentially going to have this road overtopped versus it being in a deed document that you do or do not see upon closing. Um, so we thought, plus the concern was also just to make sure the general public, not just people who are living here, and signage would be much more effective at letting the general public know that potentially this road could be overtopped in a storm. And presumably if there's a million dollar contribution to this up front, um, the expectation is that the timing would be sooner rather than later. Do you have an estimated time frame for the improvements, the culvert improvements on 40th? I might, if Randy is still here, that might be the best person to ask. Um, but because I don't, I don't think we've had, I have not had that conversation as far as the timing of the improvement. Um, so I think that's an ongoing discussion. Ask that again, please. Well, obviously there are some complex floodplain issues, and that has an impact on access both um, for emergency service vehicles and people who will live in this site and how they will be able to leave their homes and, and navigate the city. The 
private developer has made a substantial contribution up front. I don't think we see that very often, a million dollar contribution to try and help make those improvements happen. Do we have any sense of when the city contingent on discussions publicly about the CIP, but you know, any idea of when that would be most likely to occur to help facilitate this development? Yeah, we've been trying to move this project ahead. Um, we have hired a consultant to do some preliminary studies to uh, check what's, what's really needed, um, update our cost estimates, those sorts of things. Um, you will probably see something coming forward in the next CIP um, asking you to, to fund the project. Again, there are a lot of moving pieces here. We do have some other developers that are responsible for paying for parts of 40th Street. And so, um, you know, best case scenario, probably 2019 would be the earliest we could start construction on this project. Um, it'd be very, very hard pressed to do it any sooner than that, though. Okay. Thank you. Hey, John. Quick question. I heard Mr. Curry say million dollar loan. I've heard grant or gift or what contribution. What is the million dollars again? It's a, they are contributing $1 million to the project that would be repaid to them through impact fees that are paid within their development. So as their, their development pays uh, impact fees and it's estimated their development will generate over a million dollars in impact fees, those impact fees would be used to pay them back. So it is a loan? In essence, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? I, I might just add, just for, for your information, that this project, the South 40th Street project, is um, very much high on the priority list for our plan. So this is not at all taking a project out of step with what we would want to talk about. So it is very much an important project that's been on our radar. We just haven't been able to get to it as far as funding is concerned. And just in terms of timing, maybe it's a better question for the applicant, but the construction completion for these homes is, what is that roughly? I would say at the very earliest in the best of circumstances, we wouldn't be looking at people actually moving into the subdivision until late 2018, early 2019 at the earliest. So is the 40th Street improvement in line with your expectations of what is effective for your development and the people who live there? Yes, I think okay. the, the 40th Street improvement, I think, is a good solution, not only for our development, but for development, generally speaking, because there's a lot of floodplain issues going on around this general area of town. And I think the 40th Street improvement is a good solution to try to make this a work, uh, try to create a corridor that's workable for a lot of different areas that are impacted by these issues. Um, I would love to see the improvement sooner rather than later um, because as was mentioned right now, the access, the emergency services access in a, in a bad floodplain event would be via Saltillo Road. Um, however, uh, road funding isn't there. Um, the development, uh, the impact fees doesn't, don't cover the, the cost of the road improvements. Um, us paving, the developer paving Rokeby Road, and then, as Mr. Councilman Camp uh, mentioned, the $1 million loan to front the cost for the 40th Street improvements until said time that were repaid by the impact fees is the best workable solution that we could come by um, in lieu of other, other access to financing or ways to improve. Thank you. Thank you. Any other staff questions? Very Did you good. answer the one about <laughs> sorry, the, uh, about about the construction of the fire station that's likely for this area to help improve emergency response times? Just this is more of a geographical distance um, question rather than flood. They're looking to acquire a site, but it does also does not have a specific time frame because it is not part of their uh, bond money that they're working with right now. So it would be a future either CIP project or maybe a future bond issue if there was one, but it does not have a time frame yet. And shortening, by putting that improvement in, it shortens the response time from wherever that station will be located. So it's it's kind of one of those things where it's a, the improvement is needed regardless of where that station is going to be. They, they would still have to go circumvent around down the Saltillo Road um, if there was an improvement and there was a flood event. Do we do we have an estimate of, of the emergency response time to this site status quo without construction of a new station anywhere nearby? Just to we help. Can look, we can look up that, yeah. that information for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. 
So that concludes our public hearing. We can move into the voting session. Jeff Kirkpatrick, City Attorney. We did have a claimant that was here. Uh, she was a woman that had the three children. Uh -huh. oh. Sat through a considerable part of the meeting. Uh, I said that I would ask you to reopen the hearing if she's still here. I'm not. Maybe step out and see if she is close. Okay, we'll wait a moment. Okay. Do you know which item she was referring to? Yes, uh, that was the, uh, I don't know how the name is pronounced, Kurgic claim. This was a uh, city tree that did fall on her van, broke out the windshield. There's no question, we didn't have any questions about the, the bill. We didn't have any questions about the fact that it was a city tree. Um, but as we evaluate these tree claims, if we haven't had a complaint, if we had no knowledge uh, of a defect in the tree, then we uh, recommend denial. In this case, we had no knowledge of it. Okay. Did, can, can we hold hers yeah, over? Hold hers over. Yeah, she yeah. was here a long time. Yeah, that would, certainly we would have no opposition to that. And in fact, this is one of those claims that was on in June. Uh, we sent out the letter, it came back, we had the wrong address, and so we re-noticed her for today. We don't want to mess her over anyway, so uh, we'll, we'll probably go ahead and vote to exclude that, and then would you contact her and let her know that? We will do that. Thank you. <coughs> okay, please proceed, Teresa. All right, public hearing resolutions, item 10, Comp Plan Conformance 17009, introduced by Gaylor Beard. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by John. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gayla Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 11 is the report of claims against the city introduced by Gayla Beard. So moved. Second. Moved by Leary and seconded by Carl. Mr. Chair, I move we delete and carry over Brenda Gregorich's claim that was denied for $240.88. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Do you Who's want that just removed from the claims or continued yes. for one week? Uh, I think you could continue it. it. That gives us more time to bring those. Okay. Remove it, you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to remove it, then we put it back on a future resolution okay. that gives All right. us time to make sure she gets the notification. All right. Okay. Very good. It's to be removed. Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Now on the main motion. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Public hearing ordinances second reading are items 12 through 21. Ordinances third reading item 22, change of zone 17007, application of Taylor Investment, Robert Edwin Simpson and Joseph and Joanne Holmes for a change from R2 residential to RT residential at South 56th and South Cotner Boulevard on the south side of N Street, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 23 is the development and conditional zoning agreement for the property at 20, uh, South 56th Street and South Cotner Boulevard, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Just would add that appreciate the work that the applicant did to meet with neighbors and hear their preferences about the, the site and that they are working to help this, this uh, office use um, blend well with residential homes nearby. Okay. Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Mm -hmm. Next is item 24, street name change 17001, renaming West Dubois Street, located in the Highlands View First Edition as Northwest Dubois Street, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Cindy. Discussion? 
Please call the roll. Raybould? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Resolutions on first reading are items 25 through 30. Ordinances first reading are items 31 through 34. Mr. Chair, I move for adjournment. Second. German moved by John, seconded by Jane. Please call the roll. Raybould? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. We are adjourned.